Bernie, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Oh, I'm glad I could. Thanks. Um, some people have said that the, the situation in Fukushima has stabilized. Uh, do you believe this to be the case? Uh, well, the, um, the reactors are better than they've been in, since the accident. That doesn't mean that they're out of the woods, but they've, um, uh, but they're better. Um, what's happened is that um, they all have holes in them, so they're not holding water. They're pouring water in the top, and it's running out the bottom. But um, until about two or three weeks ago, they've had to constantly add water, and uh, they were rapidly filling up every available basement and every available place to, um, to store it. In the last three weeks, they've gotten a uh, system in place. It doesn't work perfectly, but it's cleaning the water enough that they can pump it back into the reactor as opposed to adding new water. So they're, they haven't created a lot of new water in the last uh, three weeks. And that's good. Um, they're still creating an enormous amount of waste because the system is now collecting all the radioactivity and they've got filters that are that are hotter than a pistol, but they have been able to uh, stop getting more water from um, a reservoir, which is about 10 miles away. So that's a, that's an important um, important thing. Um, I still believe that water is leaking into the ocean, and I know water is leaking into the ground table. Um, so they they have a enormous problem in front of them. But are they better than they were? The five months ago. On March 20, 2011, the Sydney station detected 3.3 millibarquels of iodine-131 per cubic meter. What does this tell you? That's to be expected in March. Uh, uh, there's indications that there's still iodine on site, and that's a concern, because iodine only has an eight-day half-life. Um, but early in the accident, um, Enormous amounts of iodine were in the water, and of course, when the water volatilizes, it turns, um, it goes airborne. Um, and of course, iodine is a thyroid seeker, and there's an awful lot of kids who are going to have thyroid problems in the next three to five years as a result of this. Uh, and I, I don't want to downplay uh, what's going on at Fukushima. Uh, on site, the site is better than it was. Um, on Unit five, 4, they sent in crews and they jacked up underneath the um, um, fuel pool to prevent it from breaking. Um, but in the event of an earthquake, the building is still very fragile and could still uh, topple. So Unit 4, to my mind, in, in a serious earthquake, you know, 7-5 or better, um, is in is in jeopardy, but the the bigger problem at Fukushima is the offsite releases that have already occurred, and I'm becoming increasingly concerned um, that the uh, of several things. First off, um, the Japanese are still um, analyzing it in a haphazard fashion. It seems like each prefecture is doing its own thing, and they really haven't mobilized the resources to attack it nationally. Um, there's you know, radioactive beef, there's radioactive uh, soil, there's going to be radioactive rice, and the Japanese are not sampling enough, and of course that's a, that's a serious problem. Uh, I think um, you know, if they find a couple samples that turn out negative, they're very happy not to look any harder. And I think that's um, um, that, that's not appropriate considering the magnitude of the problem. So number one is they're not sampling enough. Number two is that they're raising the, the um, dose allowable limits. Um, they're, you know, now their position is that kids can receive what adult workers used to be the limit for. And of course adult workers have now increased tenfold as well. I think what you're going to see is um, in the workforce the rule of thumb is for every 250 rem, or 2.5 sieverts, um, you can have you can expect a cancer. So for every 10 men 
most of these guys are men that are getting high doses, one of the 10 is going to get a cancer as a result of his working at Fukushima. So if 250 people get TenRem, 10 of them are going to get a cancer as a result of Fukushima. They've got 8,000 people on site, many of whom are at 10 rem. So they've all increased the probability of a cancer by something on the order of 10%. Um, that, so I, I don't think, uh, you know, we seem to think, well, they're not sick now, so let's not worry about it. But the workforce has increased the likelihood of a cancer from maybe the average person's chance of getting a cancer is 40%. Well, now, for these guys, it's 50 to 55%. Um, I can't pick out which one is going to get a cancer from Fukushima, but statistically, they are worse off because they work there. And the same holds true for the population. Um, I'm estimating that over the next five years, you're going to see a 20% increase in lung cancer as a result of Fukushima. Um, that's calculations based on what's happened after other accidents. So again, you're not going to be able to say that a person's individual cancer came from Fukushima. But when you look at northern Japan, whatever the number would, would have been statistically, there's going to be 20% more. And the last piece of that is the, uh, the Japanese are, are allowing the contaminated material to be burned as long as it's less than 7,000 becquerels per, per kilogram. That's 7,000 disintegrations every second in a kilo. So what they're also allowing is if you have a high concentration material and a zero concentration material, you can average those two out. So let's say you've got um, 8,000. You burn that. Where does it go? It goes into the next prefecture and contaminates it. Where does it go when they burn it? Eventually, it winds up in, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, either in, in B.C. or Oregon or Washington or, or California. Um, so the process of burning this radioactive waste is kicking the can down the road. Uh, I'm concerned that a prefecture may clean up and then the, a neighboring town in the same prefecture or a neighboring prefecture may burn waste that's going to come down on areas that they think are clean. So the accident isn't over. You know, that it's, it's continually throwing back up the cesium, which um, is already on the ground and, and into plants. And it's going to get worse now with the straw harvest. Um, I think, uh, you know, they, the, the Japanese um, uh, rice harvest starts in September. And um, after the rice is harvested, the rice stalks are harvested, too, as, as cattle feed, as, you know, like, as, as straw. And that straw, like the rice that it grew, will be contaminated. And with a half-life of 30 years, you're not going to let it sit in your barn for 300 years to decay. You're going to burn it. Well, I'm afraid that the Japanese are going to burn all this radioactive straw and kick the problem into the next prefecture or kick it over to Hawaii or kick it over to British Columbia or kick it over into Oregon. Um, so we're going to see another year of these rainouts. Um, a rainout is when a radioactive cloud passes over an area and due to a, rain, a, a coincidental rainstorm, that get, those hot particles get dropped on the soil. There was a, um, a, a washout in British Columbia about three, um, three weeks ago that was very well documented on YouTube. Five or six people with Geiger counters uh, suddenly noticed their Geiger counters going off, off scale. And yet Fukushima itself probably wasn't re releasing any material in the several days before it. Well, the only conclusion you can come to then is that it was industrial burning. It was burning of something in Japan that was throwing this, uh, this cesium up and depositing it on the West Coast. Well, the, the health officials keep insisting that the, the levels are minute and that there's no health and safety risk. Um, is that the case? I am working with scientists 
um, who will be publishing papers very shortly that uh, will definitively prove that to be wrong. Um, the papers are not yet um, uh, published, so I really can't go into the details of the, the scientific papers. But I, I am absolutely convinced that the people that I'm working with are very reputable and the numbers are good. So I guess I would, based on the scientists I'm working with, I would disagree with the, uh, uh, the Canadian health officials um, or the United States health officials, for that matter. Uh, rainouts are occurring, um, not just in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there was one in uh, Oklahoma uh, a couple of days ago, um, and we will continue to see rainouts. Now, with lots of citizens having Geiger counters, um, what they what they should do is um, is take a paper towel and wipe a surface. Uh, that's about a square meter, about, uh, for, for your U.S. listeners, about a foot, three feet by three feet, but a meter by a meter. Wipe it thoroughly dry and put that cloth under your Geiger counter. If the Geiger counter goes nuts, send me the cloth. Uh, I will have it analyzed in a, in a U.S. lab, and um, uh, we'd love to get some more data. Uh, don't put it in an envelope. Triply wrap it in plastic and then put it in an envelope. Uh, give me the location and the time that the sample was taken. Um, uh, but uh, I don't want to get inundated with claws with negative results. So if you have a Geiger counter and you've got a positive result on a Geiger counter, um, I'd like to see the cloth. And uh, they can contact us through the website, Fairwinds, and we can send the contact information and the packing information. We have a little, uh, a little brochure that we would send out. Um, telling them where to send it, um, how to, you know, triply wrap it. Um, I don't want, we can't take liquids. So, you know, don't sample your swimming pool and send me a, a gallon jug or something like that. We can't take liquids. Um, but a, um, a, a cloth that has been used to clean a surface after a rainout um, is, a, uh, is a, great, um, a great thing to put in the instruments we're using. The devices we're using are, are literally $200,000 machines that run on liquid nitrogen. This is not something that um, that an individual civilian can 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 afford, let alone have the discipline to um, to analyze. Um, so the lab uh, the labs that we're using are uh, using some very sophisticated techniques in a controlled environment, so we don't lose chain of custody. Um, and um, you know, we're really trying to scientifically map what's raining out on people. Why is this being downplayed? Is it a, a liability issue, or do they want to prevent panic? Do, do you have any ideas why this is, is being minimized? Um, the, I know someone who's very highly placed in the State Department, and the United States government has come up with a decision. And I don't know whether it's influenced um, by a fear of panic or commercial interests or, or whatever. But I do know that the United States government, at, at the highest levels of the State Department, as well as other departments, FDA and, 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 uh, and on and on, have made a decision to, to downplay Fukushima. And I, I can't speak for um, uh, the Canadian counterparts, but I will say that back in uh, April, Hillary Clinton signed a pact with um, with her counterpart in Japan, saying that she agreed that uh, uh, there are no problems with Japanese food supplies, and we would continue to buy them. So we are not sampling this material as it comes into the country, because our government, the U.S., has made a decision to uh, strategic decision to downplay it. And I don't know if that's because they want to. Um, support the Japanese government or whether they want to support the nuclear industry. But I do know that that decision was made at the highest levels of government. Are there any uh, websites that you, you could suggest for people to visit? Well, there's two that I like uh, and I visit several times a day. Um, one is EX-SKF, and it's a, um, it's, it's a Japanese website translated into English. Um, and, and it's phenomenal. You know, all of them are outside the mainstream media. And the other one is ENE News, um, E-N-E, 
y 